Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I am your host, Isaac Longworth, and I used to live for a very short period of time in Columbus, Ohio. And while I was in Ohio, I had invited some of my Protestant friends to come with me to Mass. They had never been to Mass before, and I wanted them to check it out. And so after Mass, I was showing them around the church. It was St. Patrick's in Columbus, and I was showing them the artwork and the Stations of the Cross. And at the back of the church, there is a shrine to the saint that I'm going to talk about today, St. Margaret of Castello. And when I was showing them the relic and explaining how Catholics viewed relics, I noticed that there was a statue of St. Margaret in the shrine. And I looked at the statue and it was a couple feet tall. And underneath the statue, it said, this statue is a life-size statue of St. Margaret. And I thought, there's no way. There's no way. This statue is only like four feet tall. And as I read more about St. Margaret's life, I learned that in fact, throughout her whole life, she never grew more than four feet tall because she had the disability of dwarfism. And I learned more and more about her and was fascinated by her life. And I think that you will be inspired by this amazing woman who had to struggle through so much in her life and yet was able to give glory to God through it all. St. Margaret of Castello. St. Margaret was born in central Italy in the year 1287, and she was born with a series of severe physical disabilities. She was not only a dwarf, as I mentioned earlier, but she was also born blind. She had a curved spine that caused her to have a bit of a hunchback, and she also had one leg that was shorter than the other. All of this from birth. Now, Margaret's father worked at the garrison of the castle where they lived. He was a minor noble, not very rich, but he was very concerned with his status, how he looked to other people. And he was very concerned that people would find out about his daughter because he himself was disgusted by his own child. He was disgusted, repulsed by all of her physical disabilities. And so he decided with his wife to keep their daughter a secret. They actually told their friends and family that she had died as a baby. And they didn't even give her a name when she was born. It was actually a kindly maid who also worked in the castle who knew about the baby, named her Margaret, before her parents smuggled her away. Because this, this maid saw that this baby, even though she had some serious disabilities, she still was a human being who deserved a name. Well, when she was six years old, Margaret almost let the secret out by trying to meet other people as a little baby. And her parents found out about it and they found it more and more difficult to keep her a secret. And so they decided that the best thing to do would be to lock her away. So they took Margaret and they locked her up in a tiny room and kept her there until she was a teenager. Imagine that. They actually built a false wall in front of the door so she couldn't get out and no one else could get in. And they fed her through a slot in the wall. It was like she was in prison. And her only crime was that she was born with physical disabilities. Imagine parents treating their child like this. St. Margaret had so much to suffer as a little child. Now, her parents did allow her to know one other human being. And that was a priest. They told a priest about her. And this priest was able to be her one friend in life. He would come and talk to her through that slot in the wall. He would teach her about Jesus, about her faith. He was able to give her the sacraments, baptize her, give her her communion, and be her one and only friend in the world. She was kept isolated from people for most of her early life. Now, amazingly, despite the cruelty of her parents that treated her in such a horrible way, Margaret didn't become hopeless. She didn't become bitter at the situation she found herself in, which would have been perfectly understandable, being locked away in a dark cell for years and years of your life. But she also was able to manifest a love and unexplainable peace in the midst of her suffering. She came to have a very deep relationship with God, who she had learned about from this priest. She prayed constantly, and she developed a deep love and relationship with him that was able to carry her through this dark period in her life. 
Now, one day, the parents of Margaret learned that there was an invading army coming to the castle. So they were in danger. And so the father decided that he and his family would flee. And so he unlocked Margaret from her cell. He put a veil over her head so that no one would be able to see her. And the family fled to another house. But it wasn't as if Margaret was free after that. She was able to enjoy some brief freedom as they were fleeing. But once they were back in a different house, she was locked up again. Locked away in another room just as she had been in their formal castle. Now when Margaret was 15 years old, her mother heard that there was a Catholic church in the nearby town of Castello. And people were going to this church in Castello because they were going to seek miracles from God. God had worked some amazing healings and miracles there. And so many sick people were traveling to Costello to seek a miracle from God, to seek a healing. And so her mother convinced Margaret's father to let her take Margaret to this church, to let her take her there to see if God would heal her. And then the mother reasoned, we won't have to keep her hidden anymore. We can announce her to the world that she really is our daughter, that that Margaret would finally be recognized as a member of the family only if she got healed. Well, Margaret was taken to the church and she was prayed with there, but she wasn't healed. She still had her short stature. She still had her hunched back. She still had her limp. She was still blind. Nothing in her physical disability was healed. And her parents, rather than taking her back to her cell at home, actually went all the way and just abandoned their daughter. They left her behind in the streets of Costello, never to see her again, leaving her to the streets. They didn't care if she lived or died. Can you imagine the rejection that Margaret would have been going through? Just imagine that. Not even her parents wanted her. She knows no one in the world. She's had almost no social interaction. She has no money. And she's also blind, barely able to walk, hunchbacked. What must she have been going through when she found out that her parents had left her behind alone in a city that she had never been to before? Well, Margaret was forced to become a beggar and live on the streets. She had to learn how to survive on the streets, even with all of her disabilities. Her whole body measured only four feet long. Her head was abnormally large and misshapen. People made fun of her and teased her because of her appearance. And yet, the other beggars of the city welcomed her as one of their own. They took pity on her. They took her in. And they showed her how to navigate the life on the streets that she now needed to become accustomed to. And Margaret was so kind and loving and prayerful that the beggars soon realized that this treasure had joined them. That this new person that they were living with on the streets and begging together with, she was different from all the others. And she even then started to lead them closer to God, showing them that her relationship with Jesus wasn't changed because she was poor, because she was disabled, and that they too could have a relationship with him like she did. Well, eventually, some of the ladies at the local church found out about Margaret, and they welcomed her into their homes. They didn't have a lot of many either, but they did have a heart, and they were able to take her in, and she never had a permanent place with them. She moved around from house to house. They would feed her as many meals as they could, and she would live with their children. And eventually, a local convent of Dominican nuns who was nearby took pity on this disabled beggar who had been taken into the homes of local townspeople and allowed her to live with them more permanently. And so she became a third order Dominican, which means that she wasn't a consecrated nun, but she did serve alongside them in their work, in their ministry. She prayed with them and she was even allowed to wear the habit which is the clothing that nuns would wear, the veils and the robes. And so they had a little habit made for her. It would have fit a child, but she wore it proudly everywhere she went. She loved the spirituality of the Dominicans, and she used that to grow even closer to God in prayer and in holiness of life. Margaret continued to draw closer to God, just like she had during her imprisonment as a child. And in that time, She really had to dive deep into her relationship with the Lord in order to forgive 
those people that had hurt her the most, namely her parents. These parents who had made her feel ashamed of her blindness, of her hunchback, of her, of her dwarfism. These parents that had kept her isolated from the world, that had denied her the chance to make friends as a child, denied her the chance to play outside. They had denied her the love that she should have received from them and had ultimately rejected her, abandoned her, left her in the streets to die. And she was able to surrender her parents to the Lord and forgive them and to actually begin praying for them. And God was able to heal the wounds that she had suffered from her parents as a child. Because in prayer, she realized more and more deeply that God was telling her that I am not ashamed of you. That God was her loving father who delighted in her, who loved her. That even though the world considered her weak and deformed, God loved her and had a plan for her life. That she wasn't created to be in isolation. She wasn't created to be alone. But that she was created to be in relationship first with God who had made her, but also with others. That God had given gifts to Margaret that he wanted her to use for his church that she had a gift of love that she could bring to other people. And she learned that she was not rejected by God. She learned that he was caring for her, that even though it seemed in so many times like he had abandoned her, that he had left her, that he was not like her earthly parents. That he was watching out for her and that he had a mission for her to do in this life. And many times she must have asked the Lord, Lord, why haven't you healed me? Why, when I went to that church in Costello, did you not heal me when you were healing other people? Why was I born this way? Then I wouldn't be in so much pain. I wouldn't be so weak. My parents would have loved me. I wouldn't have been a beggar. On and on and on, all the sufferings of her life that could have been alleviated. Why, God? Why didn't you do this? And she found in her faith the answer to this question. In Romans chapter 8 in the Bible, Paul is explaining how Christians are to deal with all of the sufferings and the hardships that we endure in this life. It reads, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For all of creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope, because creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. This is a, a powerful verse. It might be a bit confusing at first, but what it means is, is that all of the sufferings that we're experiencing right now are small compared to the glory that is going to be revealed to us in heaven. That yes, we live in a world, in a creation, that has been corrupted by sin. With sin, all of nature has become twisted and wounded, sickness and pain and disabilities and death. Not necessarily because the sin of the person, it wasn't like Margaret had earned through her sin, becoming disabled. That's not what the scriptures are saying, but it's saying that all of creation has been wounded by the collective sin of the world, which has led to all this suffering. But the good news of the scriptures that Margaret would have learned in her conversations with the Lord, in her faith, uh, discipleship, was that this suffering is not permanent that the suffering of this world is temporary and that for those who are sons and daughters of God, those who are in Jesus, await a new creation, a heaven where there will be no more pain, no more sickness. We will be set free from bondage. We will be completely healed. And God allows us to go through pain in this lifetime in order for us to become the saints that he has called us to be so that we can be completely healed and free in the next life. And Margaret understood this in the core of her being, which allowed her to find peace despite her disabilities, even coming to see her physical weaknesses as gifts from God, because they forced her to rely on his power in the midst of her weakness. 
In another part of Romans, Paul talks about how we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Margaret knew that her sufferings were were forming her character and producing hope in her. Hope that the Holy Spirit who had been poured into her life would carry her through this pain in order for her to become a glorious saint in heaven one day. And so Margaret didn't let her disabilities hold her back from serving the Lord with everything she was. Far from it. Margaret actually wanted to give back to the good people of Costello who had taken care of her, who had taken her in when she was abandoned by her parents in their town to become a beggar. Just as her priest had taught her about Jesus as a child when she was locked away behind a wall, now she taught those same lessons about the faith. She talked to the village children about Jesus, taught them their catechism, and taught them to understand what it means to be a Catholic, what it means to be a follower of Jesus who strives to become a saint. She also took care of the sick and the dying and the poor because she had such a love for these people because she knew what it was like to be seen as a burden to society, to be left alone, to be unwanted. And so she went to them to share them the love of Jesus that was inside of her. And she even went to visit the prisons to speak to the criminals there who were locked away from the world and tell them about Jesus too. And she was able to connect with them, not because their bodies were deformed, but because their soul was deformed, that their crimes had led them away from God. And now they were trapped in shame and rejection, rejection from society that wanted them locked away in prison and trapped in shame themselves, thinking about what they had done. They knew what it was like to be hidden away from people to be ostracized from society behind locked walls. And this blind, tiny woman with a limp walked around amongst these hardened criminals with absolutely no fear, just love. She prayed with them. She heard their stories. She encouraged them to repent and turn back to God. She reminded them that it was never too late to have a relationship with Jesus. And they were so touched by her story, her obvious love for them, that many of them came back to their faith that they had left behind when they were in prison. They asked to go to confession. They asked to be reconciled with God after her visits with them. She was a powerful little missionary working inside the prison walls. And the entire city of Costello came to love her. They recognized that in their midst was a saint. And they were able to thank God that despite the horrible circumstances of how it had happened, Margaret had ended up living among them. Now, Margaret, she didn't live a long life. She died when she was only 33 years old. But when she died, the townspeople demanded that she be buried inside the church, which was an honor that was only reserved for priests and rich nobles. And yet they demanded that Margaret be buried in the church, that this honor be given her. And the entire city came out to the funeral. Ironically, at Margaret's funeral, there was this young crippled girl who was healed on the spot and she was able to walk normally which was a sign that Margaret who in her own earthly life had never been healed was now in heaven and had been healed of all of her disabilities in heaven and she was already praying for that grace to be given on earth first to that girl at her funeral now during her life Margaret lived with a truly dehabilitating condition And these conditions were a cause of shame for her. They caused her to stand out and look different. It made it hard for her to do everyday tasks. And it caused her physical pain and suffering. But it was exactly those disabilities that make her story so inspiring. I think the fact that she overcame her physical limitations and lived a life for God that was so beautiful is one of the main reasons why she is celebrated all over the world today as an example of holiness for us. And what exactly inspires us about her? Well, I think that there's something powerful about people who overcome hardships and don't let it define their lives. Especially when the world says to them, you shouldn't be happy because you're blind. You shouldn't be happy 
because you are disabled. You shouldn't be happy because you're sick. And yet they are happy because they have God. When I was discerning the priesthood when I was little, seven or eight years old, I met a priest named Father Tim Divine. Father Tim was a priest from the Companions of the Cross, which is the religious society that I'm studying to be a priest right now that I'm a seminarian with. And Father Tim Divine came and did a mission at my parish when I was nine years old. And one of the amazing things about Father Tim is that he is blind. And his blindness struck me as a child. Looking at this priest going about doing his priestly ministry without the ability to see, he struck me as like a kind of superhero. And there was so much joy in the life of Father Tim. He was an amazing preacher. He was funny. And he had an obvious joy in being a priest. And I remember as a kid looking at him and saying, I want to be a priest like him when I get older. I want my priesthood to look like Father Tim which led me to joining the Companions of the Cross, which is where I am now, and God willing, I hope to be a priest one day. Part of what so inspired me about Father Tim Devine was his disability of blindness, the joy that he had in spite of it, and God was using him powerfully. And it was part of his ministry that led me to the point where I am now in joining seminary. Now, sadly, we live in a world that often doesn't recognize the incredible gift and dignity and value of people who have disabilities that they are to the world. We live in a culture of death where babies who are screened for genetic abnormalities and disabilities are sometimes selectively aborted by their parents. Euthanasia and assisted suicide are on the rise, being presented as a kind of cure for people who have disabilities, which is insane if you think about it because it's not a cure to kill people who are suffering. But our culture of death is sending a clear message that it's better off for you to be dead than it is to be disabled. But that's not what God says. God says something different. He has a message of life and a message of hope because he has created every single human person for a reason. He's created them with a mission in life. And having a disability does not exclude you either from the love of God or from his plan for the church. And so if you're listening and you know someone who has a disability or if you yourself struggle with some physical condition, you need to know that you are not shameful to God and that he will never abandon you. That you have a role to play in this world that no one else can fill because of the unique way in which you can reach people. Remember how Father Tim was able to reach me on that mission, showing me the joy of Jesus as a blind priest, setting my heart on fire and attracting me to the priesthood. Only a priest like Father Tim could have done that. Look at St. Margaret, being able to connect with beggars and prisoners who would no doubt have rejected other people who came to them But they were able to listen to her because she was able to understand their struggles and meet them where they were at. And so let's pray right now for the intercession of St. Margaret of Costello. That we would become saints like she was. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Margaret, you were treated with rejection and abandonment by your family because of your condition. But you never allowed that to make you bitter towards them, but you chose to forgive from your heart. Help us to forgive those that are cruel to us, especially those who should be the ones who need to have loved us the most. St. Margaret, you are the patron saint of the pro-life movement because you show by your life that people with disabilities are not less human and are not less worthy of life than anyone else. And we pray that through your prayers for us that we would end this culture of death that uses abortion and euthanasia to destroy the lives of people with disabilities and that instead we would recognize the intrinsic value and dignity of every human life no matter their physical condition. St. Margaret, we pray for all people who, like you, struggle with physical disabilities, whatever they are. 
that they would not become bitter towards God in their sufferings, but rather would imitate you in coming to see how much they are loved and treasured by the Lord, and that they too are called to become saints, that they have a unique role in the mission of the church in this world to reach out and inspire people in a way that God has particularly gifted them to do. St. Margaret of Castello, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.